I, I want to thank you all for joining us today, uh, both here on Zoom and also uh, on Facebook Live. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to our panel of experts who will share their experiences and expertise about what has transpired and, and what the future holds with our friendship and relationship with Iraq. We have viewers, as I was saying, from all over the world. Uh, so thank you for tuning in, uh, including our friends from the Iraqi embassy and the, in the Iraqi community. We have people from the US GLC joined us. Uh, of course, our board of directors for the World Affairs Council, thank you for your support and also for tuning in. Uh, we have a few media people involved uh, who are who are uh, who have joined us. I know WAI Radio is joining in, and also the New York Times, uh, which is a first for our council. So thank you to the New York Times for joining us and WAI Radio. And before I introduce Ambassador Moreno, who is our moderator, you will notice there are no Iraqis on the panel. And when we organized this panel, we, the World Affairs Council. Uh, we put a program together coming from the U.S. policy perspective, from, from the U.S. perspective. Um, we also, admittedly, I did not have contacts in the Iraqi community. And we would love for those who are watching, particularly from the Iraqi embassy and from the community, to share your contact information with us so that we can reach out to you for another program we will certainly do on Iraq in the, in the coming months. So please. Uh, message me on Zoom. Um, you could also email me uh, in, I'll put my email in the chat room uh, so that you could connect with me offline uh, for that opportunity. I appreciate your understanding and taking time to tune in today. Um, so the US Senate confirmed Luis Moreno as ambassador to Jamaica in November of 2014. He has served as the deputy chief of mission in Spain. He has served as the political military minister counselor and force strategic engagement in Baghdad. He has also served as deputy chief of mission in Tel Aviv. Ambassador Moreno has served as consul general and principal officer in Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, he has been the deputy chief of mission in uh, Haiti. Uh, he also served as a narcotics affairs director in Bogota. He was assigned to the U.S. Embassy in Panama as the narcotics director there uh, and became the embassy's first political military officer. He comes to us from Fordham University and, and also Keene College, and he is also fluent in Spanish, French, and some Haitian Creole. Of course, we won't test him on that, but I'm sure he could step up and do that. So. I want to thank the general and, and Joanne Cummings for, for uh, taking time to be with us. Ambassador, it's all yours. Yeah, merci on, on being Armin. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the two tremendous panels we have today. Uh, very impressive people. Uh, first, I'll do Joanne. Uh, and I have to say, before I introduce Joanne, I have a little bit of bias here and want to be transparent. Joanne and I work closely in, in the Middle East over the years, and she truly is a legend in the world of political advisors, or as we say, poll ads. Um, Joanne currently, after retiring from the Foreign Service, sadly for all of us, is now an adjunct professor in Baylor, Baylor University. I was gonna say go Bears, of course, they're the NCAA men's basketball champion. Uh, she was recent, last job in the Foreign Service was foreign policy advisor poll ad to the counter ISIS coalition joint task force based in Baghdad. She has served extensively in the Middle East, North Africa, and East Asia. Joanne was uh, raised in Lebanon, lived in Saudi Arabia, finished high school in Tehran, graduated from the University of Beirut before gaining an MA from the University of Texas at Austin. In the Department of State and Private Sector, she has worked in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, Jerusalem, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Cyprus, Ethiopia, and Micronesia, where she was a deputy chief of mission. She's also been a Paul Econ chief, a refugee coordinator, an economic section chief, a poll ad a few times, political officer and consular officer. And of course, she speaks Arabic and French, and uh, you can't get much more distinguished of that. Speaking of distinguished, 
we have the incredibly impressive military career of Major General Gerald Jez Strickland. He insists to be called Jez here, but uh, just had a tough time doing that as an old political military officer myself. Currently, <clears throat> Jez is the Deputy Commanding General of the Third Armor Corps in Fort Hood, Texas. Uh, he's been there since 2019. Uh, during his time with Third Corps, he's been deployed to Iraq and Syria. He was uh, raised in Hong Kong, joined the British Army's Royal Gurkha Rifles before attending university. He's been on operations to Northern Ireland during the Troubles, East Timor as part of the peacekeeping force. Uh, he's also been to Bosnia uh, to oversee the implementation of the Dayton uh, Accords and was involved in a generation of British forces for the first two years of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He's been deployed twice to Africa, uh, Afghanistan, and he has, uh, was actually the commander of the UK's 4th Infantry Brigade, known as the Black Rats. Uh, you talk about cool, cool nicknames, that's, that's a pretty good one. He's uh, honored to be uh, appointed as a Colonel of the Royal Gurkha Rifles in February 2016, which is an additional role he still holds, which enables him to do something to repay a debt of gratitude to the fantastic soldiers from Nepal who served with the British Army with such distinction. I have to say, having served in Baghdad, uh, the Gurkhas who are in charge of security at the British compound got our bacon out of the fire on more than one occasion. But uh, I'd like to start with Joanne uh, before I get to uh, get Jez with some questions, uh, military oriented, but Joanne, could you help peel the layer of the onion, especially uh, the occasional myths that we run into, what we mean when we pick this subject of Iraq from occupation to partnership. There's a, there's a lot of moving pieces on this. Perhaps you could give us a, an overview. Uh, I'm delighted to do that. And it's, it's great to be here with you, Luis. I also want to thank the San Antonio World Affairs Council and Armin Babajanian. It's, it's such a, an honor to be able to talk about issues like this with, with you and with someone like Jess Strickland, you know, with whom I, I served in, in Baghdad. As Luis said, I've spent many years in Iraq since I first worked with the provincial government in Najaf since in 2003. And I've lived in all parts of the country doing a whole range of, uh, of different functions from humanitarian responses to displacement, to mitigating communal tensions, to military strategy. And in my comments today, I want to specifically recognize all my Iraqi sisters and brothers who have so generously informed my own understanding and experience, including those who explained at length where they thought I was wrong. One of our problems when we talk about Iraq, particularly for foreigners, but also for Iraqis, is that we tend to have snapshots instead of videos. We are in a particular place at a particular time and, and speaking to specific people. This is a problem when, when the Americans or the British or others pop in and out and you spend anywhere from six months to 18 months doing one thing in one place. But Kirkuk, for instance, where I was in 2004, is a very different place in 2004 and now. The people who were dominant in Mosul, you know, it would depend on whether you're talking about 2006 or 2015 or 2020. So these, these are issues that I, I want us to bear in mind as we talk about it. Now we frame today's discussion in terms of the transition in the US-Iraqi relationship from occupation to partnership. And that is focused on the bilateral relationship. Even though coalition members, including Jess Strickland, played a critical role because so much of the attention and often the criticism has been aimed 
specifically at the United States. And so I think we need to address that directly. Let me lay out what I see is the distinction between occupation and partnership so we can talk about where we are now and where there may be a productive path forward. So occupation, despite the rhetoric that is still adopted by, by groups that are opposed to any US military presence, the occupation ended a decade ago. I am not addressing, I am not justifying the military operation led by the United States in 2003. That's a different issue. If someone wants to ask about it, we can talk about it. But what we do need to consider now is how that occupation and most US coalition military dominance uh, over all those aspects of state function gradually diminished before 2010. And, and so how the Bush administration's decision on withdrawal ended the last vestiges of direct US security control in Iraq. That's the end of occupation. So what about now, you may ask? Isn't there a US military presence now? Well, let's look at that argument. First, there's a clear difference between the height of US troop presence in 2007 of about 165,000 people and the height of US troop presence in supporting Iraq's fight against Daesh of about 5,000. So let's say that again, 165,000 compared to 5,000. So it's clear that the numbers are vastly different, but then we have to ask about function. Well, again, the small military coalition presence in Iraq against Daesh is completely focused on helping the Iraqi government defeat Daesh and managing its own processes. So you're gonna have people who, you know, arrange the housing and, and, and make sure that there's clean water. All US troops, all coalition troops that are in Iraq are on Iraqi military bases. There are no US or British military bases in Iraq, another major change from a decade ago. And in this fight against Daesh, again, all coalition movements and operations and supplies are under Iraqi government control. Now, there's an elephant in the room and I'm going to bring it up. People ask, what about the unilateral action against Qasem Soleimani and incidentally Abu Mahdi al-Mohandis? Although it may seem like a purely semantic issue, that operation was not carried out by the counter Daesh coalition that was in Iraq. It was not conducted by troops that were in Iraq. Criticize the strike any way you want to. It really doesn't change the role of the coalition inside Iraq. And Jez, I know you're probably going to touch on these issues as well. So the United States now is really focused on the partnership with Iraq and not solely or even primarily based on security interests. We keep repeating, you know, the nice words, we want peace, we want prosperity, we want stability for Iraq, but those are true. And they're not different from the goals we have for other countries where we are working on partnerships. And they're beneficial to all Iraqis and to neighboring countries and to, trading partners of Iraq and to simple diplomatic connections. But partnership doesn't necessarily mean agreement. 
as Luis will recognize, I frequently have to explain to friends that as a diplomat, I don't spend all my time making nice with people who like me. Often being a diplomat means working through those deep disagreements on, on policy, on, on procedures, and finding some kind of path that enables movement in a positive direction, even if there are issues that we recognize still need to be resolved. And so it is with Iraq. The massive protest movement that began in October 2019 and was really only curtailed by COVID shows the level of domestic tension within Iraq. We have to recognize that these tensions are there and they are from a range of sources. And we can go into more detail on these. Corruption remains a fundamental blot and barrier to progress. The exploitation of ethnic and sectarian tensions by politicians and by militias damages Iraqi cohesion. But that doesn't change the fact that the United States and Iraq are partners. Iraq makes its own decisions. There is another question that could be raised there about what influences Iraqi decisions. And I hope that we will come to that discussion, but I wanted to hold it really to the US, um, the US, US angle there. I also hope that we'll have a chance to talk about demographics and how people feel about uh, the, the movement and presence of people in different parts of the country. But again, that's something that we can elaborate uh, in more detail as we go forward. So I'm going to stop there. That's how I see the ground. And I look forward to both Jez's comments and any questions that you, Luis, or people in Zoom land have. Thank you very much, Joanne. And uh, you're right, we're gonna shift it a little bit more broader than just the US perspective, because I'd like General Jez, excuse me, to talk about how this mission now is really a coalition effort with a partnership. It's a partnership, not only with the US, but it's a partnership with the coalition and how things have now shifted over to mainly NATO-centric operations. And how, for instance, is uh, are the Iraqi security forces capable of acting like a real partner in regards to the fight against Daesh and other people? General? Thank you, uh, Ambassador, and, and <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, and you're quite right that uh, if you wanted a U.S. policy perspective, uh, I'm not the person to give it, as you can probably tell by my uh, by my accent. But um, but I have got some observations, I think, about this journey towards a partnership and where it's come from, but more importantly, where it's going. I, I think you have to look back at the various iterations of um, military uh, activity and partnership with uh, the government of Iraq over the course <clears throat> of the last 20 years or so. And the, the fact that the one that we're in at the moment is a very, very specific tailored operation uh, that is being conducted by a global coalition, the global coalition to defeat Daesh. And, and therefore, it has one very singular purpose. Um, and it is absolutely, as Joanne has just said, uh, being conducted in partnership with the government of Iraq and has been from the outset. But, but in that partnership, the relative roles of the different parties and organizations have shifted over time. I think, you know, if you look back to the period where it was necessary to physically defeat Daesh, to, to dismantle the caliphate that was starting to take hold, then inevitably the partnership was more based on how to conduct military operations and assistance in the actual conduct of military operations, be that um, logistics support, air support, uh, intelligence targeting, and, and all those things. But even then, and we should never forget that the liberation of Daesh-controlled territories was conducted by Iraqi security forces in Iraq um, of, of various different uh, types. Um, and 
we got to a point where once the caliphate in Iraq had been physically defeated, and I'll leave Syria aside for now, um, there were various things that needed to be done. The nature of the coalition effort, I think you can broadly divide into two right from the outset. The, the first part of it was what I just talked about, the, the assistance in the fight itself. And the second part was helping the Iraqi security forces to generate enough of their own capability and combat power, if you want to call it that, quickly enough to be able to stop the advance of ISIS and then push them back. So that meant training and equipping. Um, and that was done on an industrial scale right from the early stages. When we fast forward to the situation where, you know, when Joanne and I were in Iraq starting in September 2019, we were already in quite a different set of circumstances. And that training effort had generated a fairly large and capable Iraqi security force structure that had already by that stage physically defeated uh, ISIS in Iraq. And therefore it was about orientating it towards a different type of campaign. It was about consolidating gains. It was about making sure that uh, what had been achieved was not gonna be lost and the momentum could still be maintained. So initially that involved more training and equipping. It involved more high-end capabilities to support precise strikes against smaller groups of ISIS fighters that were still operating uh, in Iraq. Um, and it involved uh, building that partnership to the extent that the coalition could start to reduce its presence there uh, in Iraq, which was exactly what we saw happening. Um, and then uh, I think, you know, we came into this period of, you know, as is perhaps not unusual in Iraq, a number of different things that were happening at the same time. There was um, a political atmosphere in Iraq, which was, looking for change uh, in late 2019. Uh, there were other external influences that were putting political pressure on within Iraq. But the most important thing, I think, from our point of view as a coalition was that the capability of ISIS was significantly reduced. The capability of the Iraqi security forces was significantly improved. And therefore, it was time to look to the future as to what a future partnership with Iraq without this heavy military presence might look like and how we could plot a path to reducing these boots on the ground who, and I hasten to add, were not the ones doing the operations against ISIS on a daily basis. That was being done by our Iraqi partners. Um, as to how we could reduce that and set up for what will eventually one day become uh, a more normal defense relation as we would have with any other country in the region um, through, uh, through uh, you know, defense diplomacy, as we would call it. Um, and of course, the, uh, the period in the early part of 2020, when we had um, a, an escalation in tension with Iran and also uh, COVID, both happening at the same time, merely acted as a catalyst for that handover because we had already judged that the conditions were set to reduce the military presence uh, involved in both training and conducting uh, operations. But to come back to your question then at the end, how we bridged to that longer term partnership um, was a question on, on many people's minds. And NATO, of course, did have an important part to play in that. They were already established, they were building up their operation there. And given that they were orientated towards um, security sector reform or perhaps defense sector reform more specifically, um, and institutional uh, reform of the Iraqi security forces, that was actually a more appropriate vehicle for the higher level engagements uh, with the Iraqi Ministry of Defense in particular. Noting, of course, that other organizations were operating in that space as well. The UNDP advising on the national security strategy for Iraq, um, the European Union Assistance Mission operating uh, with the Ministry of Interior on policing reform, etc. So a number of different organizations working together in Iraq to assist the Iraqi government with, um, with their national security strategy development and implementation. And, and those organizations being more suited to doing it than perhaps the coalition, which had been focused on low level tactical training and dropping bombs on ISIS hideouts, et 
etc. I'll, I'll probably pause there. There's much we could unpack in all of that, I'm sure, and many other things we can talk about. But I'll, I'll leave it at that and pass it back to you. General, I'd like to do just a, a brief follow-up uh, on two points. One, you mentioned the diverse compo composition of uh, the uh, Iraqi security forces. I mean, you had, you know, federal uh, police, anti-terrorism uh, guys doing conventional warfare at one point. Uh, what, can you tell me a little bit about what role uh, and how serious a major role did some of these uh, Shia uh, Iranian allied uh, militias, uh, you know, Assad al-Haq, Qatab Hezbollah, and other organizations had in that fight against Daesh as they moved down the highway from Mosul or to Mosul? So I think, so nobody can take away from the fact that um, the, the popular mobilization forces played an important part in the operations to defeat Daesh. Um, now, of course, th those operations with those groups were not always uh, coordinated with coalition forces um, because of slightly different approaches. But the important thing to note in this is that they were uh, and remain part of the Iraqi security structure. And we were working with the government of Iraq and those were forces that were uh, put in place and agreed to by the government of Iraq. Um, so I, I think you know, that, that is undisputed. There are different views on who was more effective at what part of the campaign, etc. I think that the more interesting thing comes later as to what you then do with a largely militarized set of organizations in, in a country where that large scale threat from, uh, from Daesh is not the same as it was. It's very, very different. And, and that poses a challenge to the government of Iraq. And that's why I was referring back to security sector reform, because one of the key questions that, that has to be addressed is what, what do you do with the various um, uh, militia elements or, or popular mobilization forces or, or others? Um, and, and that is something that, that is not really in the remit of the global coalition at all, which is why in some ways it's better for an organization like NATO to come in, which is structured for that kind of uh, activity and advice. Yes, uh, just a, an unrelated question, but it's one for my kind of my own personal uh, curiosity. Uh, you know, during the early days of uh, AQI, you know, the predecessor to, to Dash, they really was a very typical asymmetrical warfare, guerrilla warfare, terrorist activities, bombings, targeting civilians and all. Then all of a sudden, when Bangladesh and ISIS and al-Baghdadi started getting successful, they kind of transformed to almost conventional warfare, actually gaining territory, holding territory, printing their own money, initiating their own Shia law all over. Why, why did, and in the end, of course, that was a fatal mistake for them, I think. Why did they do that? Well, what was the thinking back? It's a, it's a very good question. I, I think if you study any form of insurgency, and perhaps that's what we could call it, um, there is a model which suggests you have to build a certain amount of popular support, but eventually uh, you have to then consolidate that support to realize your longer term gains. Um, but I think, you know, most the history will probably judge it pretty clearly that. Uh, Perhaps the timing was wrong in that they moved too soon into that, or perhaps the timing in their case could never have been right. Because um, as soon as you start to go into conventional warfare, uh, you open yourself up to being dismantled piecemeal by the military machine that can be arrayed against you from Western nations supported by you know, regional partners. Um, and so, uh, Yes, I mean, it clearly was a mistake, but, but I also think there were many other mistakes that, that Daesh made uh, in, in what they were doing in Iraq in particular. And, and I think if you go and talk to many Iraqis, as, as Joanne has done much more than I have, but, um, but, but many of them absolutely had had enough of Daesh very, very quickly yeah. because the excesses and the ways in which they operated. So it wasn't purely the fact that they decided to go for conventional military force approach. It was the fact that they resorted to oppressive methods rather than gaining popular support. Perhaps they couldn't have gained popular support because, you know, there wasn't simply enough 
baseline support to, to make that happen. So the oppressive methods that are used combined with their decision to uh, turn themselves into a conventional force meant that I suspect that their defeat was pretty inevitable yeah, um, exactly. and relatively early on. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite topics uh, to talk about. If I could go back to Joanne for a second. Uh, Joanne, uh, General and I had mentioned a bit about, uh, about Iran and back in the old days, you know, with General Dierno and General Austin, we always talked about the uh, malign influence of Iran and how that's playing. How, how do you see today that whole uh, Iranian influence of now in light of the Saudi Iranian talks, uh, what's going on in Syria, et cetera? How, how does the whole Iranian thing uh, come out now? You know, it's such a good question because Iran has been a major player in the region for millennia. So it shouldn't necessarily surprise us that this iteration of Iranian leadership sees, sees it to be right and proper that they should have a major voice. That's quite apart from the particular makeup of this Iranian regime, which has its own reasons for wanting to expand its influence. So holding in mind that, that Iran is a large economy and a large population and a large territory. When, when we first started talking about malign Iranian influence, it was an effort to distinguish between natural engagement, uh, religious tourism, trade, uh, exchange of scholars, things like that, that, that are to be expected and are not damaging to Iraq, um, as opposed to things that appear to be detrimental to Iraqi stability and cohesion. So with that, then we look at uh, how some of the um, how some of the players shake out now, because there's enormous concern about whether some of the militias that are part of the Hashishabi, the, the, the PMF, are in fact operating under the instruction of, under the control of, in the interests of the national government, or whether they are more directed from outside. That's going to be an issue that Baghdad has to address. We can make our perspective known. NATO can, can provide guidance on, on how to rationalize the process. But I think there is cause for concern because the, the weakness of some state processes, the, the endemic character of corruption, the exploitation of ethnic and sectarian divides all play into the ability of some militias to exercise control that is very hard to peel back. Right, uh, let me follow up on that. If you remember, Joanne, in the old days, there was a school of thought, which fortunately that went, did not went out, that the solution to the Iraqi uh, problem was an Iraq divided in three states, a Kurdish North, a Sunni Central, and Shia South. That, that didn't happen. Those of us who wanted to keep Iraq as, as one country, one out. Can, can you address that a little bit in the sense that people think of the Kurds and have a tendency to think in monolithic terms that all Kurds are the same. You know, the Pershmega is, is the same. Every, could, could you delve into that just a little bit? I certainly will, and I'd also, um... <coughs> You know, because Jez has has worked some on on the direct coalition mil military uh, support to the Peshmerga. So, Jez, I'm flagging that for you. You're right. The country is heterogeneous. The populations tend to have majorities in different areas, but it's very, very intermingled and has been for centuries. 
because we tend to define people, Iraqis tend to define people by what is the father in the family. So if the father in the family is a Sunni Arab, it is a Sunni Arab family. But in many cases and in many parts of the country, a family has admixtures of all of the other groups. This is happening less now. And I think that that's, that's a, uh, a shame for Iraq. When I was in Kirkuk in 2004, virtually all families were mixed. Uh, but young people were telling me that their families didn't feel it was appropriate anymore. So, you know, we do have things breaking down. But even within communities that an outsider might say, well, these are Kurds and these are Shia Arabs and these are Sunni Arabs, even within those groups, there are deep um, clan and tribal differences, there are political differences, there are affiliations with different leaders. We have to remember that even though we look at the, the, the Iraqi Kurdistan region and say, well, you know, that's Kurdish, it has minorities within it. And the two traditionally major parties there had a civil war between them. So, you know, they, they have not at this point been able to put forward a common front for the elections that are coming up in October. So tensions continue that the Sunnis are not unified. The protest movement that I mentioned largely arose among the Shia in the South and was critical of Shia leaders and the influence of Iran upon them. So I tend to look at this all as a good thing because when you have people just falling back on, I am one of these three things, then it's very difficult to have a discussion of how do we move forward. But when there are subdivisions between the groups, it's, it's more like you have democracies, you have a number of voices that have to be considered. But then Baghdad has to hold to a process where these various voices are expressed and their interests are represented and their red lines can be negotiated. Thank you. Uh, General, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I will. Uh, Joanne mentioned that you could address uh, dealing with the Pershmega and different aspects about that. But is the kind of uh, drawdown of US presence in Syria, is that going to affect it? Many people said that we were like kind of leaving the Kurds in the lurch and so on and so forth. Could you address that? And, and as a follow-up to that, uh, there's been some expression, uh, is NATO taking on training of uh, human rights and, and, and type of uh, comportment by the uh, security forces to respect human rights and civilian populations, et cetera? I know it's two very different questions, but if you could address that, please. Yeah, um, thank you, Amasa. There's a few things wrapped up in there. I think the first thing in relation to Syria um, that I would say is that like in Iraq, our operations against Daesh in Syria have been conducted predominantly by our partners uh, in that area, <clears throat> in the northeast of Syria. Um, and uh, the, the biggest partner being Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, um, who we have worked with in order to uh, put that pressure on Daesh, and they were the ones who defeated Daesh in northeast Syria with help from the coalition. Um, and, and so that relationship is maturing in the same way that the relationship with the Iraqi security forces uh, is maturing, and they need less support now in order to be able to continue their pressure on Daesh. Now, of course, there are lots of other pressures going on in Syria, um, but they are not the business of the global coalition. Uh, the global coalition is there to make sure that Daesh cannot have a resurgence. And therefore, you know, what we're seeing is that we don't actually have to be physically sat next to our SDF partners for them to be effective security partners. Of course we don't. Um, they're, they're very capable of maintaining control in their areas. Um, they do need some support and assistance, but that doesn't have to be with large numbers of people uh, operating on the ground with them. It, exactly the same as it is across Iraq. 
Um, if, if I can just cycle back to Joanne's point about the, the Peshmerga, you know, so of course, uh, again, I come back to the Global Coalition, its role was across the, the northern half of Iraq, including the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Yes, there was a different approach or a different training relationship with the Peshmerga than there was with other parts of the Iraqi security forces. Um, but it was a close uh, relationship. But one of the things that we have found is that in its current status, I was gonna say in its dying days, which, which is to a certain extent what it is of Daesh, um, the areas in which they feel freest to move and operate are generally um, towards the north of Iraq, east of the River Tigris, the areas like the Hamrin Mountains, the Mahmoud area, Diyala. Um, and, and they are areas where the security situation is slightly more complicated. Um, but we as a coalition have worked extremely hard with Peshmerga forces operating under control from Erbil and uh, Iraqi security forces operating under a direct control from Baghdad um, to make sure that they cooperate and coordinate with each other. And, you know, it is a slow process because we're not pretending that there aren't disagreements in that area, but um, we are definitely seeing some progress and movement in the right direction on that. So with capable forces that are suitably equipped for the task, um, which have the right uh, relationships with coalition partner nations, I think we're actually, we're actually doing reasonably well in that area. Um, your, your final point on human rights, I think the global coalition forces who were involved in training uh, were absolutely involved in helping the Iraqis to include things like uh, human rights and uh, law of armed conflict, et cetera, in their training. Um, and when we had a very close relationship with organizations like the ICRC, who were very interested in the support that we were providing to our partners uh, on that. Uh, and I have no reason to suspect that NATO would be any different. In fact, I'm sure that they would continue in that vein. Thank you. Uh, Joanne, uh, I have a question here that's interesting. It's kind of a general question, but it's an interesting. What makes Iraq different from other countries in the region? You know, it's, it's, it is an interesting question because you, you can say, well, Iraq is, is, is unusual in its heterogeneity, but so are Syria and Lebanon. You can say, you know, I Iraq has a unique uh, configuration around major rivers, but so is Egypt. I think that one, one of the factors that we as, as outsiders have failed to recognize is that Iraqis feel themselves to be the, the recipients of, of this massive civilization. And when, when we may say, but you know, you're not doing this well, there, there's still a sense that, but don't you know who we are? And I think that we have failed to recognize the, the unique characteristics of how Iraqis feel about themselves. But, you know, you have layers of, well, Pan-Arabism and you have layers of different kinds of economic views. And then you also have many, many layers of resentments and fears and hostilities among and within groups. None of those are absolutely unique to Iraq. But when you, when you dice and slice the Middle East, which you know, I spend a lot of time doing, the things that characterize Iraq are its desire at some level to be a large coherent thing, despite all of the many elements that pull it apart. And I, I honestly do believe that all of the groups within Iraq who are frustrated at the way things are going now want them to go better. 
It is not forget that we're leaving, although for some people it may be, but by and large, it's we would like to want to be more fully part of this. And again, this comes back to how is Baghdad going to decide to manage things? Right. Uh, you know, being that I'm uh, by nature a bit naively optimistic, I, I want to ask you a question about a, an image that was flashed around the world through the media of uh, Grand Ayatollah Sistani uh, with the Pope. Uh, people were even poking fun of the, uh, of the picture, which I didn't like. But I, my personal opinion, Sistani has been a tremendously uh, moderating force in, in Iraq. And two part question, does that picture of him with the Pope, does that give us hope for a future of coexistence and, and understanding? And two, what happens when Sistani dies? I mean, he's about 90 years old, is he not? He's in his late 80s. Um, and, you know, I used to say that there were two people I'd give organs to, and one was RBG and, and one was Sistani. And, um, his, his passing will be a, a huge loss to Iraq. I think we all recognize that. I think that what is important about the meeting between the Pope and Ayatollah Sistani is not just that it happened, but that so many Iraqis saw it as being a notable and positive and important event. You know, whether it is, look, the Pope came to Iraq or look, the Pope thought it was safe enough to come to Iraq or look, we were able to have this meeting between these, these two religious leaders. It was broadly seen as a positive thing. Whenever you have people in a country, whether it's the United States or Iraq, all saying, hey, this was a good thing, I'm happy. Exactly. So I, I think it was striking and most striking in that it was valued. Thank you. Uh, I guess we'll close it out because we're running down to the edge here and Armin's going to interrupt me. But General, are you optimistic uh, for the coalition and the uh, Iraqi security forces future in, in dealing with the situation as it now exists and a very extremely complicated security, political, and military environment? So I am I'm optimistic about the ability to keep uh, ISIS down and to being a, a, a relatively ineffective force. You know, I'm not belittling the consequences of some of their actions. They will still conduct the odd attack. They will still make life pretty miserable for some people. But I'm optimistic about um, the, the prospects for keeping them to being a low priority security threat in Iraq. Um, the broader security issues facing Iraq, uh, I, I think, you know, it really could go any number of different ways. Um, I, I think there are, there are certainly causes for optimism in there. Um, but as we all know, it, you know, there are a lot of things that can come in from the flank and, and cause some disruption. And we're seeing some of those playing out over time. I, I think, you know, I, I stepped back a little bit in time to, well, I think it was around about October 2019, where we had a uh, effectively an academic forum in Baghdad, uh, which was the first of its kind, really, you know, as we were coming out of this really bleak period of conflict and, and trouble. And it felt like um, normalization of some sort was happening. This was a society in which the security argument was not the dominant one anymore. That it was still there, but it was not at the volume perhaps that it had been previously. We, we then went through, um, you know, a, a, another blip, if you would like to call it that. But I think the more we can put the longer gap between these spikes, and the more we can have more normal activities such as the boat's visit and all, all these other things, then I think we're really stepping into a direction which says that, you know, this is actually a relationship which, um, which is much more normal and, and has much more cause for optimism within it. So, so I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm too optimistic, but I think there are definite grounds for optimism. 
Thank you very much. I, I think we're all optimistic and we're all certainly hopeful. I think that uh, Armin is uh, kind of put an end to my uh, my moderation here. I'm sorry, I did not did not get a, a, into all the questions. There were some excellent questions that we didn't have time to get, but to be honest, I was sneaking a few of, uh, of the public questions uh, into, into my own. So uh, I want to thank both of you. Joanne is, as always, fantastic. And General, you know, I, uh, I hope I have the, uh, the distinct pleasure of meeting you personally one day. Absolutely, I like that question. Thank you, Ambassador Moreno. I, I am a little disappointed. I didn't make Joanne's list to uh, make, to get a donation uh, uh, of, uh, uh, I think she mentioned she, she had uh, organ donations and we weren't on the list, so. Oh, well, I guess we'll I have, have to- I have more organs. Okay, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thank you all for uh, uh, participating in this program. I know we didn't get to uh, 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 Rad, uh, Ragad Al Saidi's question, um, but thank you for tuning in. I also want to thank the Embassy of the Republic of Iraq, uh, Mohammed Hasham Al Fatian. I will reach out to you to see if we could uh, do another program in the coming months. And thank you to the Iraqi community for tuning in from all over the world. Um, as well as you tuning in on social media and also on Zoom, as well as our friends at WAI News Radio and the New York Times. So thank you all for, for, for taking time to do that. If you'd like to learn more about the World Affairs Council, about membership, uh, there's a link uh, that will be popping up here shortly in the chat room. Or if you'd like to make a gift to the council, uh, we'd really appreciate that. Lastly, uh, these uh, individuals are not only very intelligent, very uh, uh, introspective and, and uh, empathetic to the communities that they have served, but they have also taken time to be with us, Ambassador Luis Moreno, uh, Joanne Cummings, General Gerard Strickland. Thank you for being part of such a vibrant and important discussion. I know we will have to continue this topic at another time. Uh, so I appreciate you all. Uh, thank you for tuning in and for your support for the World Affairs Council of San Antonio. Have a great day. Thank you.